My name is Brent Sellers. I'm the Extension Weed Specialist at the Range Cattle Research and Education Center. And my co-author is Jose Diaz, who is my PhD student. So this all started uh, a couple years ago with some con conversations with colleagues from Australia, basically wanting to know identification of our smut grass species. Are we sure which species we had? And uh, I didn't really understand why they're asking that question until I got to Australia, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> that led to some conversations just overall in general. About that time, the Dina Research Office came out with a research proposal um, basically asking for proposals for international travel. And the purpose of that was to uh, develop some international relationships that could lead to future research or extension opportunities. So through my conversations with my Australian colleagues, I asked them if they would be willing to host myself and my PhD student, Jose, because that was one of the stipulations on the travel grant. And uh, they said they were willing, so we applied for the travel grant through the Dean of Research, and we were awarded $10,000 to go to Australia. So we spent every dime plus some to go over there, but I think it was well worth it. We learned quite a bit, and um, we've come back with some ideas, and I think we've given them some ideas. So I think we'll, we've developed a pretty good relationship so far, and hope that will uh, carry forward in the future. So before we got there, um, my local ho host, and actually let me go back a slide, our local host was uh, oh, Dr. Wayne Vogler, and he is in the picture sitting next to Jose, uh, my, my PhD student, and uh, didn't know what we were getting into when we went over there, and I don't think he knew what he was getting into either, uh, but we had a really good time. He was very humble, and he did an outstanding job organizing our trip. He had everything down to the T, where we were going, where we were staying, and it was just phenomenal. And so I'm very grateful for him um, allowing us to come over, basically driving us around for two or for a week, uh, which I was grateful for that because when you see semis coming at you on the wrong side of the road, it kind of freaks you out a little bit. <clears throat> so it gave us a week to get used to driving on the wrong side of the road, driving on the wrong side of the vehicle, all that good stuff, and uh, before we started driving at the end of the first week. We're also uh, grateful for the Dean of Research for providing the funding as well. So before we left, um, Dr. Vogler sent me this link to a newspaper article, and it basically says that world leaders in this past, and they're talking about smut grass in this case, are about to descend on Gimpy. And I was just like, what in the world is this all about? So I start reading this article, and it basically names um, Dr. Vogler and myself as being world leader, leaders in smut grass management. It's like, okay, no pressure, Dr. Wayne, no pressure. So we carried forward, we went over. Um, we left Tampa at the end of February, to went to Houston, and then went on what I felt was one of the world's longest flights. And it actually is one of the world's longest flights, um, going from Houston directly to Sydney. And that flight actually wasn't too bad. I was able to sleep on the way over there. On the way back, it was absolutely the world's longest flight. Um, didn't sleep, but maybe 30 minutes. But anyway, we got there and we made it back. We flew into Sydney, and then we flew up to Brisbane from Sydney, and we spent the first 10 days in Queensland. And we went from Brisbane north to Gympie, and then from Gympie north to Gladstone, and then Rockhampton, and then traveled back down to Brisbane for a few days. So before I get into the rest of the presentation, I thought I'd give you a little bit of background on smut grass in Australia. <clears throat> they have 12 to 13 different Sporobolus species, which is the genus for smut grass. Four to five of those they consider weedy. And they basically refer to this group of smut grass species as weedy sporobolus grasses. So in Queensland, they have giant rat's tail, which they have two different species, uh, sporobolus natalensis and sporobolus uh, pyramidalis. 
and then American rat's tail, which is Sporobulus jacamontii, and which interestingly, our taxonomists have started renaming our giant smut grass Sporobulus jacamontii. And then in New South Wales, which is south of Queensland, they have pyramidograss and giant pyramidograss. Okay, so those are the species that we were looking at for the most part. And, but we spent, like I said, the bulk of our time in Queensland looking at those smut grass species. So <clears throat> I thought what I'd do for this presentation is give you a few photos of, of where we went and basically describe you know, some of the interactions that we had, some of the things that we saw, and then go into some other details further in the presentation. So the first location we went to was Gimpy. And um, this is uh, one of the locations where we saw different methods of management. And um, the first method of management, this guy was very proactive. And this is the picture on your left. Extremely proactive, actually. So he's been using herbicides, spot treatments, a wiper. But basically what he does is every time he goes out into the field and he sees a seed head, he clips it off. He's really preventing seed production from occurring in his pastures. And the second location we went to, there's actually another one in the middle that was just complete monoculture of smut grass. But the second one I have pictured here on your right this one was a pretty good infestation of uh, a smut grass and their management level is obviously much less than the first place we went to. So they've been using wipers and spot treatments and then their herbicide of choice over there as well. And haven't been overly successful um, overall. And there's some environmental concerns uh, that or environmental issues that go with their herbicide as well. And I'll get into that as a little in a little bit. The second location we went to was Gladstone or Miriam Vale. And this, we're up on a ridge in this situation. And the reason I wanted to show these pictures is because um, these smut grass clumps are actually turning brown. And there's some natural pathogens that they're finding that are affecting the smut grass. And they're trying to isolate those and develop those. But there's, there's underlying issues with this whole process as well, and uh, with the biocontrol agents, and I'll cover that when we get back to Brisbane in the presentation. Dr. Vogler also had several research plots in the area, and we stopped at one of those locations. And basically, he's doing some of the same research that we've done in the past, where we're looking, where they're looking at herbicide applications in conjunction with fertilization and also in conjunction with uh, mowing. So we spent probably an hour looking through these plots. And these have just been established, so there's not a lot to see at this point. But I'm hoping this is something that Dr. Vogler will continue to share with us as things go forward. And the most northern location that we went to in Queensland was Rockhampton, and we went to Central Queensland Tech University and they are very big into precision, precision agriculture. And I didn't really know why we were going there, and neither did Wayne, actually, or Dr. Vogler, actually. Uh, but we found it to be very interesting. We thought of some ideas where we can use uh, some of their equipment to do some large-scale research. So what is pictured is called a walk-on weighing system. And the way they have this set up is that cattle have to go through this weighing scale uh, to get to their water source. And it's, they're basically tracked by an RFID tag in their ear. So every time they enter that scale, their number's recorded and their weight's recorded, and they can track, you know, average daily gains, they can track calving, they can track a lot of things. They also use GPS collars on the cattle as well to be able to track where they're grazing in the pastures. And, but the neatest thing is if they're rotationally grazing, the gates on the side of the chute, as they come off the scale, will open one way or the other. So if they want them to go to a different pasture, they can make them go to a different pasture just because they go through that scale. So we've thought about how we could use this system uh, for uh, looking at how smut grass affects cattle production as a whole. And, um, 
So this is something that we continue to talk to our colleagues at Central Queensland <coughs> University about and uh, continue to talk to Dr. Vogler about and hopefully develop some interesting research protocols of using this type of equipment. They are also using the same, some of the same type technology that Dr. Bouton is using with the spiders to basically tell them when a calf is about to be born. So a lot of similarities in research uh, between uh, Australia and the U.S. At each location we went to, we were also able to give presentations. So Dr. Vogler usually gave a, a presentation on basic uh, smart grass ecology and biology. And I followed up with um, presentations on smart grass management in Florida. So we probably talked to, in person, about 350 people and then another 300 people on a webinar that we conducted in Brisbane the following week. So after we returned to Brisbane, the following Monday, the second Monday we were there, we went to the Brisbane Herbarium, and we spent quite a bit of time with uh, you know, the gentleman in the left, uh, John Thompson. He is one of the taxonomists in the herbarium, and uh, I finally started to understand why they had such an issue with identification, uh, because another gentleman was there named Joe Fatelli, and I'll cover him in a second as well. And basically, they're trying to identify the different species uh, because they're trying to develop biocontrol agents. But they can only get those released if they have no impact whatsoever on the native Sporobolus species. So that's why it's very important that they're able to definitely identify the weedy Sporobolus species from the natives. And that is proving to be very difficult. So uh, Mr. Thompson in the picture is actually talking about scrapping all the taxonomy they have on the Sporobolus species and starting over. So we discussed that quite a bit, and I think it's a, quite an overwhelming task, uh, but it might be something that they continue to look at, and time will tell. But this will be very important for them going forward uh, concerning their biocontrol efforts that they're trying to get accomplished. So the next day, on Tuesday, we spent at the Ecosciences Precinct with Joe Batelli, and he is the one in the middle picture on the left. And he is really the one with the boots on the ground looking for all these different pathogens, uh, isolating pathogens in his lab. That's, that's what the gentleman's doing on the right picture. And um, he's the one that's doing a lot of this work, getting the funding for this. He's also doing herbicide work as well. So it's very interesting. He has a lot of the different smite grass species growing in his greenhouse and testing all these different pathogens as well as herbicides applications. Okay, so one of the main differences that I see between the U.S. and Australia, especially Florida, is how they approach their management strategies. When they have invasive species that are very difficult to control and that are spreading rapidly, they become quarantined. So you'll, as you drive around the country, you'll see signs like this one that say, the species is a threat to agriculture and the environment. Please call this number if you see it or if you have questions. So we saw this for giant rat's tail uh, grass, but also ragweed parthenium and several others, and basically there are local governments that they call councils, we would refer to them as county governments here, and uh, they are, or they set regulations that landowners must follow to help reduce the spread of these invasive species. So how are they managing smut grass in Australia? Well, in Australia, they have a herbicide called fluproponate. In Florida, we have hexazinum. Uh, both of these are root absorbed. The fluproponate, which is called, one of the trade names for it in Australia is called Task Force. It takes four to 12 months for kill to occur. During this time, the smut grass plants still produce viable seed. So that's kind of a, a scary situation. They also have a four-month grazing restriction. So when you compare that to Florida with our Belpar or hexazinone, 
It takes an optimum conditions, 30 days to kill the plants, and thankfully we don't have a grazing restriction anymore. And we don't have mandates that we have to control it or manage it or make any reasonable approach uh, to manage it. However, in Australia, there are local governments that have mandates that they need to take all reasonable efforts to limit spread. So <clears throat> they have come, um, and every council or county is different in their level of enforcement and what they require their landowners to do. Uh, but some of the data that Dr. Vogler has put together over the last several years has helped drive uh, some of these mandates. So I kind of wanted to show you some of that data as, as we go forward. And because uh, I, I found a lot of this very interesting and it, it makes sense when you sit and think about it. So some of the data that he showed was really looking at how the grass soared or how the grass stand affects smut grass germination, establishment, and reproduction. So when you look at what they called gap sizes in the sward, if you had no gap, even though there were seeds there, they got no plants to germinate, so then they had no flowering. But as you start to increase the gap size in, in the grass stand, not only do you start to get plants, but you also start to get tremendous amounts of reproduction. So 33 seed heads when you have 120 by 120 centimeter gap size in that stand. And, but then a lot more plants, 243 plants. So as time would progress, if they had grazing pressure on their desirable species, that would just probably explode like we normally see in Florida. So having a good grass stand is going to limit smut grass seed germination. Another set of data that he shared is actually kind of scary because um, we even get these questions in the U.S. You know, if I spray a herbicide, does it prevent seed production? And not necessarily. It, it really depends on when the herbicide is applied. And that's what Dr. Vogel is showing here. So zero days after flowering or anther appearance, if you spray glyphosate, you basically have no treated, or you basically have no seed germination, either untreated or treated with glyphosate. Okay, as you delay and go out to four, eight, 12, or 16 days after flowering, especially at 16 days, you see 95% seeds uh, on plants that were not treated versus 86% viability of seeds on plants that were treated with glyphosate at 16 days after flowering. So that tells us that smut grass has the capability of producing seeds within mature viable seeds within 16 days after flowering. That is extremely scary when you think about some of the management practices that we use when we use mowing, we use burning, and you see seed heads form within a couple weeks. That means you basically have two more weeks and you're going to have a mature seed set. Another set of data that Dr. Vogler showed uh, was smut grass seed longevity. We've always said here in Florida that the seed probably lasts two to three years. And, and they've looked at this for their species and their environmental conditions in Australia, which is actually pretty similar to ours. And they're showing smut grass seed viability upwards of 10 years. And uh, even though they're down to around 20% within seven, eight, nine years, 20% of 45,000 seeds, still a lot of seeds, so we're still going to have a lot of viable seed in that seed bank, even after 10 years, or even after seven or eight years. And then the last set of data that I'll show you from uh, Dr. Vogler is the distance of spread uh, from the reproductive clumps. And this, I think, has probably been, probably been one of the most influential data sets on some of the mandates that they've set forth um, at their local councils for limiting spread. And basically what this shows is that seed spread doesn't really occur past 10 to 12 feet from an individual clump. So they've used this then to sh for mandates. And what they've done is they said, if your 
pasture is along a roadway or you're bordering another property, you need to create 80 to 120 feet buffer strips. And they do this with their food propanate herbicide. So this is one of their reasonable efforts that they say their landholders should do to help limit spread. Because they're going to, especially along roadways, they're going to really prevent seeds from getting on the roadway and then being transported uh, by mowers or cars or whatever. One of their other methods of management is through the use of weed wipers. We're used to the roto wipers here in the U.S. as well as some homemade devices. Um, a couple of their most popular ones would be the one on the left. They like this because it doesn't push the clumps over. It actually will actually ride through these clumps and get a solution onto the leaves that way. The other one on the right is more of a homemade device, just a PVC pipe with nylon rope attached to them. And uh, I grew up with this one in the Midwest. We used this for volunteer corn and soybean, and uh, it was fairly effective. I liked it because the it was up in front of the tractor, and you could see wherever that would need to be raised or lowered. But I think there's better technology than that today. So this was a common site, and this is one of the vehicles we actually rode around in quite a bit. Um, these councils, they, they're very active in uh, treating invasive or noxious weeds in their councils. So there, a lot of times you see these vehicles driving around spraying and stopped and looking at different species, making sure you know, that they've controlled the right species, that they don't have a different invasion. So they do a really outstanding job I feel, uh, of staying ahead, or trying to stay ahead, in some cases, of some of their invasive species. Okay, so after we were done in uh, Queensland, we traveled south into New South Wales, and we spent uh, a day and a half in Grafton. And in Grafton, thankfully, we finally got a, a little bit away from smut grass. We still talked about smut grass some as well, but they were most concerned with tropical soda apples, so we spent a day talking about smut grass to private landowners, but also tropical soda apple, and we talked with the uh, Division of Primary Industry uh, folks as well about tropical soda apple, including herbicide and biological control uh, with the TSA beetle. And uh, they are at the very early stages of invasion with tropical soda apple, so they think that they can still eradicate it. So hopefully they got some good advice from our programs here in Florida, what's happened, what's been successful, and what hasn't really worked well. And hopefully they'll continue to monitor their invasions and continue to decline their densities. So once we left Grafton, we traveled down to Sydney. On the way down to Sydney, we stopped at a private landowner's. He invited us uh, when we were in Grafton to come see his uh, operation, basically because he was raising one of their uh, pathogens called Negr Negrospora rhizae. And uh, basically he just, this is a product that he had developed over the years, and he was able to sell it as a biological control agent. The Australian government made him stop doing that, so he's now only able to sell it as a soil ameliorant. But he did show us the symptoms in the field of what happens to the smut grass, and basically it starts killing the growing points, which are the lower pictures uh, on the left. And then he showed us the spores that are formed inside the sheath on the grass, in the lab, and then some of the uh, effects on the actual plants in the field. So it was a very interesting trip, and we're very grateful for Jeremy Bradley and Kathy Eggert for allowing us to, to see their facility, and very informational. And we'll continue to uh, talk to them about this and talk to some of our pathologists in the U.S. about whether this is something that could be utilized here in the States. 
Okay, so a lot of business, and like I said, Dr. Vogler really packed our schedule, which we're grateful for, uh, but we were able to have some fun too. Uh, Dr. Silvera gave us an idea of going to a koala sanctuary where Jose and I were able to feed kangaroos and look at koalas, and that was a good time. Uh, one of our hotels was close to an outdoor mall. Uh, we walked around quite a bit and then went on a couple boat tours in uh, Brisbane as well as Sydney. But I think Sydney was probably, at least iconic-wise, when you think about Australia, um, probably the most interesting to walk around. Um, we saw the Opera House as well as the giant bridge on the right. And as we're standing on the, the sidewalk of the Opera House, I was looking at the bridge and thinking, that would be fun to go on, because you could actually go on tours. And uh, when I looked it up and saw it cost $180, I thought it looked pretty good from the distance. So my take home uh, from our trip is that uh, their issues with smut grass in Australia are disturbingly similar to ours. Um, a lot of frustration among growers, a lot of frustration among researchers. Uh, they are committed to finding biocontrol agents, but the taxonomy is really going to be key. If we can't ever figure out a way to identify the non-natives versus the natives. It may be difficult to get those biocontrol agents approved for use. And based on you know some of the data that we've collected, but also Dr. Vogler's, it's just reaffirming this, that good grass competition may be our best bet to help limit spread and invasion of smut grass throughout. And the last slide, basically, of this presentation is a quote that Dr. Vogler ended his um, presentations with in Australia. And, and I thought it was really good because I thought it summed up very well uh, the issue of smut grass. And it says, a recurring theme is the importance of a competitive, well-managed pasture store to minimize gaps within the pasture throughout the year, thus preventing giant rat's tail grass or smut grass, seedling establishment from the long-lived soil seeping. Without a vigorous, competitive pasture being present, any attempts to control giant rat's tail grass or smut grass will be futile. And I thought that really summed up very well um, how we should approach smut grass management in Florida. I think the more competitive pastures we have, the better off we'll be in limiting smut grass invasion in our pastures. So this is actually the last slide for the presentation. Um, I am having a smut grass field day on May 24th. Registration is limited and capped to 80. I think we're close to 65 right now. And our next webinar will be June 12th from 11 to 1145 with Dr. Mario Benelli, and he'll be covering the UF Brahmin Project. Well, thank you for listening. I hope you uh, got some information uh, from this presentation. Uh, we certainly enjoyed our trip to Australia and learning what we did while we were there. And like I said earlier, we are very thankful for Dr. Vogler for hosting us and for uh, Dr. Burns and the Dean of Research Office uh, for offering the international travel grants. Thank you and I hope you have a good day.